Monday, July 20th. The day began so hot and humid that Judge Ralston reconvened court outside under the trees. And then, while a crowd gathered, Darrow and the defense team called a surprise witness. If Judge Ralston refused to permit an expert on evolution to testify, perhaps he would allow an expert on the Bible. William Jennings Bryan. The idea of the defense lawyer calling the chief prosecutor as a witness is absurd. Uh, it's a totally inappropriate role for an advocate to, to play. And the judge realized this. He thought it was crazy. The other prosecutors thought it was crazy. But Brian thought it was an opportunity to have the debate, to, to, to make his case. He knew what Darrow was going to do. Darrow was going to try to ridicule his religious beliefs, and he was not going to allow that. Against everyone's advice, Brian took the witness stand. The crowd swelled to almost 2,000 people. The courtyard was packed. There were not enough seats to hold all of the people, and they were standing around. The benches had been set up all in front of the stand, so we had a seat right in front of Dara and Brian, and I was all set to hear the great trial going on. Darrow began with a simple question. You have given considerable study to the Bible, haven't you, Mr. Bryan? Yes, sir, I have tried to. Do you claim that everything in the Bible should be literally interpreted? Bryan replied that some parts of the Bible should be taken literally, others symbolically. William Jennings Bryan was sitting there with a big palm fan and a handkerchief in his hand. Dara is in his shirt sleeves with red suspenders, which he wore. He jumped up right in front of him, took hold of his red suspenders and flipped them and said, do you really believe that uh, that whale swallowed Jonah? I believe it, said Brian. And I believe in a God who can make a whale and can make a man and make both do what he pleases. Did Joshua lengthen the day by making the sun or the earth stand still? Did God make Eve out of Adam's rib? Now these are questions, the typical village atheist questions that Clarence Darrow's father had used a half century ago. Indeed, Clarence Darrow had asked them in an open letter to William Jennings Bryan two years before, and William Jennings Bryan knew enough then not to answer them. Now it was too late. Under Darrow's rapid-fire assault, Bryan retreated into simple answers and jokes. Mr. Bryan, do you believe that the first woman was Eve? Yes, I do. Do you believe she was literally made out of Adam's rib? I do, Mr. Darrow. Did you ever discover where Cain got his wife? No, sir. I leave you agnostics to hunt for her. It is fascinating to read the transcript of the trial. Brian had the local audience very much in the palm of his hand. Time and again in the transcript when Brian responds to one of Darrow's questions, the person who was recording the, the events uh, would write applause, laughter, uh, over and over again. Brian was their champion and they were egging him on. It was very much like a sporting event, you know, cheering your hero. And I think Brian won the local battle overwhelmingly. Darrow, of course, understood that the real battle was being fought out nationwide, and he was playing to a larger audience. Darrow was always much more interested in discrediting Brian than replacing Brian's view by his own. He could tear down things. He couldn't build them. Prosecutor Tom Stewart desperately tried to stop the interrogation, but Darrow pressed on. Mr. Bryan, do you think the Earth was created in six days? No, sir, not six days of 24 hours. The creation might have been going on for a very long time. Yes, Mr. Darrow, 
it might have continued for millions of years. Finally, at one point, Brian said, it doesn't make any difference to us whether God created the world in six days, six years, six million years, or even 600 million years. Well, that played right into the defense hand because they said, well, if you can interpret those things in the Bible, why can't we interpret the story of the creation of humans in an evolutionary sense? By now, the defendant in the trial had been forgotten. John Scopes was in the audience, filing a story for a reporter who had left town. He thought that Darrow was making a fool of Brian. The crowd was growing impatient. He just kept pushing him and pushing him. You know, I wanted to get up off of that bench and go up there and kick him. It was just, I imagine people out there in the audience felt the same way, to make him hush. The thing was, he was attacking the Bible. Finally, the judge said to him, well, what do you mean you are harassing your own witness? What you are asking him has nothing to do with the issue of this trial. We want you to put a stop to it. Brian pounded his fist, refusing to step down. The only purpose Mr. Darrow has, he said, is to slur at the Bible. I object, Darrow shot back. I am examining your fool ideas that no intelligent Christian on earth believes. The radio audience in Chicago is able to hear William Jennings Bryan stand up near the microphone and he did speak to the microphone and he said that he was going to defend the word of God against the greatest agnostic and atheist in the United States. Suddenly it was over. Judge Ralston announced that court would adjourn until 9 o'clock the next morning. Slowly, the crowd dispersed. The media spin began at once. The national press announced that Clarence Darrow had exposed Brian's mindless belief in biblical scripture. But Southerners called Darrow's inquisition a thing of immense cruelty. As so often happens, the issues of the trial, which were already extremely simplified and extremely black and white, uh, were even further simplified as the media reported the trial and reported uh, this final debate. The media likes winners and losers, and the general media saw this very much as uh, Darrow's triumph and Brian's humiliation. On the eighth day of the trial, it was time for prosecution and defense to deliver their closing arguments. Darrow played one last trick on Brian. He waived his own right to a closing argument. By law, Brian would not be allowed to deliver his own final address. The world would never hear the anti-evolution speech he had been working on since the trial began. It would not be published until later that year. It is considered one of Brian's best speeches. As he lays out the scientific case against the theory of evolution and the social indictment of Darwinism. Judge Ralston charged the jury with deciding whether John Scopes had indeed violated the law. Had he taught evolution in a Tennessee classroom? After just nine minutes of deliberation, the jury declared that he had. Then the defendant himself spoke for the first time. Your Honor, Scopes said, I feel that I have been convicted of violating an unjust statute. I will continue in the future, as I have in the past, to oppose this law in any way I can. Brian had won the case, but when he spoke to the press, he sounded less than triumphant. Someday, he told them, this issue will be settled right. <laughs>